welcome to another episode of The Ordinary Gentleman. Uh, I am Lennox Kalfungwa and I am joined today with a very special guest. He's a, he, he means a lot to me and it's my honor to just introduce him uh, to, to you and uh, hopefully learn um, a lot of things through this, through this interview. So I just want to introduce uh, Gavin Peacock. Um, welcome, Pastor Gavin. <laughs> Good to be with you, Lennox. Yeah, um, you know, I'm, I'm never, I'm never quite sure how to how to introduce you. Um, and if you don't know, Pastor Gavin, uh, one of my great dreams in life is to be a, a ring announcer. <laughs> I think I could give you a pretty incredible introduction if I <laughs> if I wanted. Um, but of course, you know, you're, you're known to have uh, to have played in the in the Premier League. Um, with, with with several clubs, Newcastle and uh, and Chelsea, um, I guess maybe two of the bigger clubs you played for, um, and and you're now a, a pastor in in Calgary, uh, Canada. So um, yes. how do you usually introduce yourself? What do you what do you usually tell people? Usually, I introduce myself as a, as a, as a husband, as a father, uh, as a, as a pastor. Um, and obviously mainly as, as a, as a Christian man, but, um, but all that to say is, yeah, I, I had a, a career, 18 year career as a professional football player, soccer player in, in the UK for, uh, for QPR, for Chelsea, for Newcastle, three of the bigger clubs. Um, and then I retired in the early two thousands, uh, and I worked for six years for the BBC broadcasting, uh, all the football across the nation and then at the World Cups and so on and so forth. And then I gave it up uh, to prepare for some uh, church ministry. I've been a Christian since I was 18, um, but I felt a strong call to church ministry during that period of time working for the BBC. And so I was testing that out, doing a little bit of preaching, some studies, and then I decided to give up the second dream career, really, um, for the vocation of pastoral ministry. Um, came left England, came to Canada, where we'd been coming for quite a while, for some anonymity, really, while I was doing my studies. And then uh, that was 2008. In 2011, I'd finished. I would have been preaching a lot. I'd been getting offers to go back to the UK, and I got an offer, a pastoral position here in Calgary, Alberta, in Western Canada. Decided to stay, and now we're 12 years into our Canadian adventure. Hmm, that's, that, that's pretty incredible. That's really incredible. Um, and you moved there with uh, with your whole family. You've got uh, two kids, I believe. Yes, Jake, uh, who's 27, and he's been married to Krista, Canadian girl, for five years now. And uh, they're expecting the first child, our first grandchild, in February uh, of two, 2021. And Ava, who's been married to Austin, uh, an Alberta boy. Um, and Austin, they have been married for two years. And they're all members of our church, all, all believers in Christ and uh and so we, we have a, a good close knit um, family. We feel very blessed. Oh, that's incredible. Congratulations on, on being a grandfather. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait. Looking forward to it. Um, I was trying not to be the, the annoying in law, you know, every time I saw them, are you pregnant yet? Pregnant yet? But uh, no, it's, uh, it's, you know, children are a blessing from the Lord and, um, and the fruit of, uh, of marriage. And uh, of course, uh, they don't make a family, they expand the family. A husband and wife is already a family, but the, the children expand that family. And, and there's, great, uh, there's great glory in um, creating uh, image bearers and potential Christians as well, uh, bringing them into the world. So yeah, we, we can't wait to see uh, our little one as, as he or she arrives. That's, that's incredible. Um, if, if you have a grandson, do you think he might, uh, he might be a football player? He could be, but I mean, my son is a professional a Muay Thai fighter, so yeah. martial arts. So he owns his own gym in Calgary, and he he's so he's going to be kicking something, a, a bag or, a, or <laughs> an opponent or a or yeah. a football. Um, but yeah, I mean, my father was a professional footballer for seventeen years, and I followed in that trend. And then Jake, who was a decent um, amateur footballer, he did play well for his school and and that, but wasn't going to be good enough to be a pro mm -hmm. footballer, uh, really excelled in, in martial arts. So you never know. I think with, uh, with his father's influence, if it is a boy with his father's influence, it could be, uh, could be another little martial artist, little ninja. Absolutely. 
And I look forward to seeing what happens there. <laughs> Great. Uh, so Pastor Gavin, you, you've spoken quite a lot on the biblical roles of, of men and women. Um, and mm -hmm. I just want to know, where did this passion begin? Um, mm -hmm. but, well, what prompted you to take, um, to take this topic seriously and, um, and to deal with it with, um, with a lot of clarity and, and, and courage? Mm. Well, um, I can remember actually when what really sparked my interest was uh, I was living in the UK at the time. This would have been probably, I want to say, around about 2003, that sort of time. And um, uh, I'd been reading a little bit of John Piper and then I was going on a vacation and I downloaded uh, a couple of sermons from John Piper. Didn't know what they were, just downloaded them. And, uh, you know, for people that don't know John Piper, a very uh, good pastor, teacher, writer in the United States here. Um, and anyway, I was on the plane and I put the, uh, I put the ear uh, pods in. I'd been reading Piper, but not, I hadn't heard him preach. And I, the first thing uh, I thought was, wow, I've, this preaching is electric. Mm -hmm. And the second was the topic. He was preaching on biblical manhood. And I'd never heard preaching uh, as clear, as strong, as passionate, as biblical, and as clarifying as, as Piper was on these issues. At the same time, I was seeing in the church in the UK, particularly the Anglican church, a real move bringing in, you know, the, uh, the, the, the female vicars and, and pushing for female uh, bishops and all of that. And these, the egalitarian uh, impulse was was really prevalent. Um, and so I could see that this was a real problem in the church and I heard the preaching of it. I then put that together with the fact that I'd been in a very male oriented environment all my life, working with men together. And I always say, you know, being with men together, uh, where, where you're playing for something great, where the, 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 the cause is big, the risk is, is high, that brings out manhood in men in, in a good way. Um, if you look at the good things in sport. Um, and so all of those things, I saw great need for biblical men and women. And, uh, and so it sparked my interest. And, um, and I began to just naturally teach on the stuff just as a pastor in men's groups and men and women together, marriage stuff. And of course, these issues have just over the last 10 years become hot button topics. And so it seems for a time such as this, you know, uh, the gospel is the main thing, but these issues are extremely important. They're not tertiary issues. Yeah, that's really good. In fact, one thing that I've, I've heard you say before is uh, talking about the importance of, uh, of being where the battle rages most. Mm. Um, and I mm. suppose this is one of those topics where, uh, you know, the battle is raging. There certainly is an attack on, um, on the biblical roles of, of both men and women. Yes, it's, it's, it's all, ultimately it's, a, it's an attack on the authority and sufficiency of the word of God. And that is the battle in every era. It was that way from the beginning when the serpent whispered to Eve, did God really say? And she begins to doubt God's word and the authority and sufficiency of it. Um, the, the biblical wisdom, I think, is to see where the, that attack is happening most prevalent in your era, in your age and then dealing with it um, in that area. It, it's fine, you know, we ought to be speaking on missions. We ought to be speaking on all these other topics in the church. But if you're not nailing these key issues, a lot of people are avoiding them. Why do they avoid them? Because it's the key issues that they get pushed back on. Why do they get pushed back on the culture? Because that's where the battle is raging. And if you're not addressing it where the battle is raging, you're gonna lose the war. Uh, and uh, so when I teach on, on these issues, I make it about the authority of, and sufficiency of the word of God. Yeah. And, I, and I do link it very heavily to, to the gospel of, uh, of God as well, Jesus Christ. So um, that it's Christ-centered, God-exalting, biblical manhood and womanhood. If you don't have a robust understanding of the sexes, binary sexes, male and female, from creation, mm. um, made in the image of God, equal uh, in value, but different in form and function. If you don't have that rooted deep from creation, mm. you will struggle to have answers for the LGBT 
LGBTQ plus 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 uh, agenda that's in the culture today. Um, and, and that's what many Christians are finding. So I've written on the issues with my friend, Dr. Owen Strand on, uh, in a book called The Grand Design. And then we've just had a trilogy that's come out on what does the Bible teach about um, lust, homosexuality and transgenderism. That's fantastic. In fact, um, I, I'll provide a link to, to those resources and in, um, in, in the link to this video so that people can access those. So, mm. yeah, that's really good. Um, now, now you, you spoke about, you know, being growing up in an environment where you're always around men um, and men mm. on, a, on a mission uh, to uh, to achieve things together. Um, I, I'm interested in knowing uh, which men have had a significant influence on your life and, and what things uh, you learn from them specifically? Yeah. Well, the first man to have a significant influence on my life, and uh, in many ways the biggest influence, is my own father, um, my father Keith. Uh, you know, my father is not a Christian, um, but, uh, but I was brought up in a loving home uh, where my dad did take a, a, a lead in the home, loved my, my mom and, and my sister and me, provided loving authority and discipline, uh, and, and spent time. Uh, with us as his children pouring into us and of course I wanted to follow in my dad's footsteps and um, and, and so I had that sort of admiration and respect for, for him spent a lot of time with him uh, over my career as well because we had that link with the, with the football um, and so there was that influence uh, there and I had a lot of uh, sort of common grace wisdom that, that he gave me um, and then, of course, men that have had an influence on me spiritually and would be um, a, a pastor called Alistair Bolt, who really brought me to faith in Christ as an 18-year-old young professional footballer who walked into his church and came to his youth group afterwards, and he taught me the gospel, and I believed upon Christ and was saved. And he walked me through those early years, and then... Um, I suppose a, a guy, I'll, I'll mention two more, uh, a guy called Tony Roke, who was a, a vicar. When I went to Bournemouth, I got a move to Bournemouth um, in 1989 uh, when Harry Redknapp was the manager then. And oh, wow. Bournemouth was second tier and he bought me. It was a record signing. I went down there and um, this guy contacted me, Tony Roke, and he was, he was a former apprentice professional footballer who had become a vicar, loved his football, but really mentored me and my then young wife, we'd only been married a few months, um, and taught us a little bit about marriage and manhood and womanhood. Um, and then finally, Graham Daniels, who's the uh, chief executive of Christians in Sport UK, has been a good friend of mine, and he's a former professional footballer, but a very uh, godly man. And so I've had men... Uh, who have been pillars in my life from my father to these these spiritual mentors who have been with me from uh obviously from my birth as my father but from my spiritual birth um as an 18 year old uh, up until now and that's very important i always say that to people you know you need good strong men or if you're a, a, a woman a, women uh, a, a around you as mentors uh, in your life absolutely that's pretty incredible um, just moving on a little bit, I, I'm interested in just getting your commentary on, on what you see in men today. Um, are you mostly encouraged or discouraged by what you see in men today? Uh, I'm, I'm slightly discouraged, um, if I'm to be honest. Uh, I have a twofold probably uh, reaction, a uh, visceral reaction, is, you know, I think a lot of men are not manly. Um, I think there's a soft center uh, to much of what is pr promoted as manhood today, uh, almost an effeminacy uh, in the way that so many men carry themselves, um, a passive passivity. Um, and there where you get a passivity, you often get a passive anger. Um, so I see uh, abdication of taking responsibility and taking dominion in their lives and in the lives of others around in, in a biblical sense of benevolent dominion for the good of others. Um, young men putting off uh, marriage, for instance, you know, for the sake of uh, playing PlayStation or, you know, just hanging out with the boys, not wanting to take that responsibility and, and going after a wife and building a family. Um, 
So all of those things, uh, it disappoints me and concerns me because, you know, when you lose the men, you lose the home, you lose the church, you lose the culture. Uh, men are supposed to be protectors and providers and, and men are not protecting the home. They're not protecting uh, the church and they're not protecting the culture. And I mean morally protecting as well as spiritually, spiritually protecting as well as physically protecting. A lot of guys would say they'll protect physically, but spiritually and morally, not so much. So that's one visceral reaction that's, you know, is bad. Mm. It needs to change. The other visceral reaction is I have great empathy for a lot of young men today because I look at them and I think they've got no role models mm. where they've never been taught to be men. And the world is telling them that manhood, masculinity is toxic and to be a man is bad. Um, and I say, no, masculinity is not toxic. Sin is toxic. Yes. Masculinity and biblical masculinity is actually the antidote to much of the toxicity in the culture today. Mm. Um, so it's that twofold reaction. I want to, you know, uh, rebuke and awaken men with a, with a powerful, clear message. At the same time, I have a lot of compassion. Uh, and, I look, and I look out and think, you know, you need fathers. Mm. And I want to be a father to you and bring you along and show you a better way, God's way to be a man, that you might then grow to be an oak of righteousness. So that's the twofold yeah. uh, uh, attitude that I probably have. That, that, that's really good. Um, I just want you to touch on a little bit, um, what does it actually look like when men um, faithfully live out their calling in various spheres of life, uh, the home, the church, and, and society at large? Um, when men assume the role that they're called to, to, to assume, um, those spheres will flourish because they're called to take responsibility and, and, and leadership in those areas. So a man who's, who's head of his home, who exercises loving uh, authority and, and, and protection and provision for, for his wife and, and children will actually cause those his wife and children to flourish. He'll be... He'll, he'll give his wife a, a, a platform, if you like, to flourish in the ways that she can, is called to flourish as a woman. Mm. Um, and she won't be, because women, and, women are intelligent, they're capable. This is not a question of, of competency with the male-female roles. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question of divine design. Um, so if a man is not assuming his role to lead and take those initiatives and responsibility, a woman will go into the vortex that he leaves naturally. So then she's taking on those responsibilities. Then she can't do what she's called to do in the way that she wants to do it. And she'll be left frustrated and tired. Um, but if he does take those responsibilities, if he is initiating, um, if he is uh, providing uh, spiritual guidance to his wife, and then you uh, teaching and discipline to the children and not just leaving it all to her, uh, the children then flourish as well. Um, the children have a pillar in their father that they can look to, one that they can respect and love, um, and one who uh, loves their mother and shows actually what, a, what Christ is to the church, a, a loving head who, who leads the church for her good and that is obviously the picture that paul paints in ephesians 5 of the husband wife relationship um so in the home you'll see flourishing in the church where godly male elders lead the church well um that church uh will in general it doesn't be perfect just like a home won't be perfect will have health um and um and it flows out into the culture as well um you know there's principles in place in the home and the church that are very clear, not so much in the culture, not all women submit to all men, like a wife submits to her own husband. But there is a sense where in a man is a, bit, a man all of the time with women all of the time and vice versa. And he's, he's going to interact with them in that way. So there should be a natural sense that a man would protect a woman in a, in a violent en encounter just because he's a man, um, those kinds of things. Uh, will uh, will show you will get a healthy uh, culture in and around and outside of the home and church as well. That's very good. Um, I really appreciate you um, um, touching on that very specifically. Um, what I want to know next is, uh, you know, I've heard you speak often about 
um, the need to be very specific about the roles of men and women and not to simply, uh, you know, give generalizations. Uh, yeah. and, and one of the things that I've, I've heard you say often is, uh, you know, it's important to, to understand what it is to be a man and not a woman and what it is to be a woman and, and not a man. And uh, so what I want to know from you specifically is, uh, what does it actually mean very specifically to be a man and, and not a woman? What are the distinctives um, yeah. at, that characterize men? Yeah. Well, I think you look from creation that God created a man and he, he created him male and he created him first and he created the woman as a helper fit for the man. Um, and so, and then Paul uses that, the apostle Paul uses the, and all the New Testament writers always refer back to creation when they're talking about marriage and roles in marriage and roles of men and women in the church. And so at the heart of, of manhood is, is, this, um, is this leadership, this responsibility, taking a responsibility, uh, initiative, leadership, I would say. So I, maybe I'd draw a diagram of a heart with, with leadership in, in the middle. And then out of that, that leadership looks like protection and provision for those in in his care uh, and the flavor of it all is love loving sacrifice um and uh so so in the home then he's to be a, a head who 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 provides physical and spiritual protection and provision for for his wife he's going to be the the guy that that, that sets out a moral plan for for his home he's going to not leave all things to his wife and sit down with his wife he's going to be the initiator in lots of ways not that his wife never initiates anything but he's not going to be passive letting her to take all the uh strain of the marriage he's going to be saying how about we do this let's sit down let's talk about our marriage uh what's our week look like how are we going to do this with the kids and that with the kids he will um uh, he will encourage her counsel and listen to her counsel and you know they are a team and um, and sometimes he will take her counsel as a better idea than his own and, and show wisdom in that way. Um, and in the church, you will have biblically qualified men who have part of the qualification is that they are managing their own households well if they're married men. Yeah. So if you can't be a good husband and father in the home and be an example of it, you don't qualify in the church yeah. because the church is the household of God. So you then take that into the church. Um, and then I just say in, in the in the society, you know, you want uh, you want young again. There's this this heart of leadership. We want to build up young men to train them to be leaders. And I would say as well um, that you know there's going to be women leading in certain things and certain fields in culture and jobs and what have you. But are you training your young boys to be husbands and fathers? Mm. Uh, that is a big question for many parents today. They might be, you know, training their kids to be a sportsman um, or a doctor or a lawyer. Nothing wrong with that. But being a, most people will still get married. There's still the percentages for marriage, and it's still the biblical norm. Mm. Uh, and yet, Paul says that singleness, godly singleness, is good. Mm. But it's still, most people will get married. But are you training men, men to be? leaders in the home you see so because it's the heart of manhood um you've got to be that kind of leader and for many young men it's not on the horizon so they don't take initiative they don't go after a, uh, it's not on their mind to think i want a wife i want to build a home uh, and family um so that's my you know a bit of a working definition of of manhood as as different to, to womanhood not that a woman would never take a lead in a certain situation, but that's the primacy that you'll see in manhood. In womanhood, it, it will be uh, to a nurturing, uh, a helping, a life-giving uh, that was her role from creation. Uh, the women are life-givers, they are helpers, and, 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 and that is a, a beautiful thing. And, and both are equally good in, in the sight of the Lord, um, but they do attach themselves to mass uh, as masculine and feminine properties uh, in their prevalence even if there's some crossover sometimes yeah that's really good i really appreciate that um another question i have for you pastor gavin is um, what skill set do you think um are essential for for every man uh, to master um and how can can men uh, develop develop various skills that will that will enable them to 
uh, to fulfill the, their God-given roles? Mm. Well, um, you know, I think you part, part of being a, a man and a very clear part of being a man is that initiative leadership and you've got to be uh, able to have self-control to start mm. with. Mm. So you've, you know, if you don't, if you're not a man with, with, with self-control, you're not going to be able to lead anyone anywhere. You can't lead yourself. Um, so you've got to be, I would say, I think uh, in three areas, um, pro probably, uh, is your uh, spiritual life. Mm. Okay? You need to take control of that and you need to have a skill set even in doing that. You need to develop skill in terms of the word of God and be able to read it, understand it. Uh, apply it to your life, pray. So you need to develop a vibrant uh, devotional life to start with, to take care of your, your spiritual life. And, and then help to do that would be leaning into older men who have walked the path before you to give you some wisdom of how can I, how can I make this an integral part of my life every day? The second would be um, to take care of your, your physical self, mm. uh, your body. Uh, is important for men uh, not to be wimpy men. Now, we're all built differently. You're a, I've played football with you, soccer with you, you're a bigger guy than me, right? right. So um, you've got a bigger frame and, you know, potentially you might be a stronger man, but I ought to be as strong as I can be uh, with the body that, you know, that, that God's given me. You know, I don't, I, there ought to be a tone to you, a certain fitness and um, some physical fitness is of, is of some value. Now, it ought not to be our idol and our obsession, but a man whose body is um, toned, who ha does regular exercise, is a man who's showing self-control in that area. So spiritually, he's under control. Physically, he's exercising mastery over his own body. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the third so, so spiritual, physical, and the third would then be, you know, um, work of uh, family and work life if you are obviously a, um, a, a husband and father um, and, and, and you're exercising dominion in that area. You're, mm. you're, you're taking order. If you're a husband, you're first a husband to your wife and then father to the children. And then you have your job and you're first, even though you're providing physically for that wife and children with your work your first concern your first work is them uh, so you're getting those priorities in place um, again all of these things you can uh, you can develop skills and help and wisdom in applying them and how you do it from looking reading and looking at all uh, other men and role models that, that can that can feed you should you be able to you know change a light bulb and uh, you know change a tire uh, on a car and uh, you know do certain things I think potentially yes uh, that that is a good thing you know if you can if you can do that you again it's like how do you, I can exercise certain dominion I can do certain things I'm not useless or you have to be really really good at something so you can afford to pay someone else to do it yeah <laughs> exactly if, if you can bend a ball like Beckham you can pay someone to change your light bulb <laughs> <laughs> absolutely I wonder if David Beckham's ever you know <laughs> Have you enjoyed handy work? I don't know. Yeah, that's really good. Like I, I, I was just laughing to myself when you were speaking about physical strength. Um, man, I've seen pictures of of you back in the day. You never seem to skip leg day, ever. No, no, no. Yeah, my legs are strong, but they're not so strong now. Um, there's one thing I would add as well is that um, you know to, to to the I suppose to the spiritual mental side of things mm. is the reading of the bible but also reading in general now men in general are not great readers yeah um and then you need to uh, train yourself to be a better reader if you will grow uh as a spiritual man so just not just reading the bible but reading uh, theological books mm. and not just theological books reading other stuff reading some great works you know reading some great literature um, some, some of the, the great literature of the last century and reading older works, it, it, it makes a man more well-rounded so that he can, he can look at history and, and see the, the mistakes and successes of history past. And so he has a general wisdom and God's given common grace to, mm. 
unbelievers in, in the world so we can actually learn from. Like, you know, we can learn from nature. Look at the ant and how hard the ant works and don't be lazy. Um, so I think uh, to develop being a reader as part of your spiritual and mental uh, self-control is an is important thing for a, for a man. And that, what that will help do as well is make you a better speaker. Mm, that's very you good. Know, I, I could go on, but, you know, out of the spiritual life and reading well is actually being able to then put that across with your mouth. Uh, being able to be concise if you need to, or expand and you know have a speech because you're a man. How are you gonna how are you gonna lead by example? And part of that is your speech. It's gonna direct. It's gonna direct your home. It's gonna direct in the workplace, and so on and so forth, or in the church. So you've got to be articulate. And back in the day, they would train young men to be able to stand up and make a five or ten minute speech and overcome nerves and um, those kind of things. It's very good. Uh, speaking of reading, just off the top of your head, what are what are some standout titles that have uh, that you've enjoyed? Um, I think a paradigm shifting book for me was John Piper's Desiring God. Mm. Um, uh, you know, Piper uh, has just done wonders to breathe life into the doctrines of grace, into mm. into reform theology, so that it's not just this this tight. Uh, you know, hybrid, you know, the tight theology that's, that's academic in a way. It's, it thrills the heart. It gives you a clearer picture of God. Um, a quest for godliness, um, J.I. Packer, um, and anything really knowing God by Packer, um, you know, those kind of books from Packer, very good spiritual life stuff. Um, wonderful writer. Um, uh, Thoughts for Young Men, J.C. Ryle. Um, Bishop of Liverpool back in uh, the day now when he wrote that so many years ago and yet you read it it's like he's written it yesterday mm. it's a thin book spiritual gold for young men um, and then you know right these are the theological writers that live today Sinclair Ferguson's a favorite of mine as well anything by Sinclair uh, on the Christian life and uh, being a you know a child of God is mm. he's uh, he's wonderful wonderfully warm and um, yeah, and then, you know, uh, other writers. I mean, I like to read a bit of Thomas Hardy, uh, Victorian age writer, very deep, rich, uh, descriptive writer of, of old England in the west of England and um, uh, takes interesting, some of these writers like Thomas Hardy or Dickens, Charles Dickens, is the amount of description and yeah. detail that they give in a, in a world where we're all about sound bites and we never slow down to even smell the roses yeah. and look and which this COVID situation has slowed people down to, to think more and take notice in detail. These guys are, are just masters in description. And, um, and so just, uh, you know, I, I read a little bit of that and, uh, as well, just to stoke the fires of creativity. That's really good. That's really, really good. Um, I'm just interested to know as well, Pastor Gavin, um, what are your thoughts on how you've seen feminism affect men? Um, well, it, no doubt it has affected men, which has affected the whole culture uh, that we live in. Um, and and, and mo what I was saying, most, a lot of men are feminists. Mm. Because it's, it's the waters they've swum in for the last 50 years. It's all they've known. So we, they default feminists themselves, which is, a, and it's affected their own masculinity. So the thought of some of the stuff I've said today, taking dominion, taking leadership, getting out there, finding a wife, being a leader in the home, exercising authority, that's just so foreign to, to men. Um, and, and, you know, the, the damage that feminism has, has, has done is, is, I don't think we've really seen the, the end of it so far. You know, it's, it's married up with the whole LGBT uh, or, or movement. Um, and it's causing, you see, feminism not only uh, emasculates men, it, it defeminizes women. Um, so men have been damaged in the sense that f feminism has, has attacked what true manhood is, and this is where I've got this empathy for many men because they're told it's bad, manhood's bad, they're bad, they're the problem. Mm. Um, and it's, 
it's damaged uh, men because then many men are default feminists and it's damaged men because many women are not proper women mm. they're not feminine women and that's been a damage to men as well so um it's it's, it's been a big problem and yet you know we have the w word of god that you know jesus christ will build his church the word of god is sufficient now what we're seeing is what we're seeing now is a is the very foundations of what it is to be human mm. is being undermined. Like there's no fixed binary sex. If there's no fixed binary sex as male and female, then it, everything's up for grabs. Yeah. Um, and what, and the, from the very first pages of scripture, those scriptures are being torn out. So the foundations of the building are rocking and people are seeing the folly of it to some extent. Um, I think it may get worse before it gets better, but they're looking and going, well, you know, man is fixed and, and woman is fixed. You can't change that. Even if you try and change it with surgery, it doesn't change what you actually are. It's a, it's a pseudo reality. And, and in the end, it needs untenable reality because what God makes is good. And that word good in the Old Testament means that it's uh, not only morally good and right, it's efficient and effective and harmonious. It works. So what is good created by God works. What is not good does not work. So you will see a society that does not work well. And of course, it's very obvious that uh, if you, you know, throw in the towel on what it is to be a man and then how that flows in his function and what is it to be a woman and how that flows in her function, uh, it won't work. And now is a great chance for the church to embrace true masculinity and femininity with joy so that we can present a, a joyful counterculture to the world because it's God's good design and God's goodness works. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, I, and I'll just say one more thing on the, on the function of, you know, you see in Genesis that God creates the man male and female. And in the next line, he says, be fruitful and multiply. So, out of created binary sex, fixed male, fixed female, is be fruitful and multiply, have babies. So there's a definite physical uh, 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 difference between the two and a functional difference that flows directly out of created male and female. And the functional differences, the physical differences are connected to that. It's not disconnected, it's connected to that. I'm created that way, a constituted male. I'm constituted female, therefore I look like this, therefore I live this way. I'm, I, I, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a life giver if I'm a woman, I'm a helper, I'm a nurturer, I'm a leader, a protector, a provider in some way a, 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 as a man. And we've all got different personalities, and so we're not cookie cutter images of each other, but, but those principles will ought to be uh, evident in all men and all women to some degree. That's very good. That's really good. Um, I just want to uh, yeah, ask you about, um, about your son, Jake, who is mm. a, a very exciting um, Muay Thai fighter to watch. I, I've really enjoyed uh, watching his fights and just you know, seeing how amazing he is. And I think he really does embody some, some pretty amazing uh, qualities. You know, he seems very tenacious, uh, humble, yeah. um, um, and very driven to... Uh, to be the best he possibly can be. Um, and um, he, he's clearly had to um, challenge um, a lot of adversity um, and uh, has, I think, is a better man for it. Um, are, are these qualities that you sought to instill in him? Um, what exactly were you trying to, to raise him to be? Yeah, well, Jake was born with one hand. He has right, no right uh, hand and to a third of his forearm on his right side and so uh, it's all he ever knew um, and uh, so we you know we just treated Jake just normally we didn't coddle him we, we let him find his way on certain things physically um, so it's never stopped Jake doing anything and at times where we thought he should do it a certain way he we had to sit back and let him do it his way because it was his body that he needed to kind of work a way of doing, whether it's tying shoelaces or his buttons on his shirt. And uh, as we might think we could do it with two hands, um, it's different. So there's a certain amount where I've stepped back and just not coddled him, but let him have uh, 
freedom to do his own thing. But the other sense, he needed to be disciplined, he needed to be taught. Um, I've tried to present a, a role model for him to follow as a, as a spiritual man, uh, as a husband, as a father, uh, as a pastor in the church, um, and as a Christian sportsman, you know, uh, which I was all my career, for him to follow um, and to instill character in him. Uh, that, that self-control, um, you know, that is key for, for a young man to develop, you know, to control your anger, to, to, to subdue that, to channel energy and, you know, good uh, determination and aggression into the sport, um, to, be ec to be excellent and pursue excellence in what you do. So it's not wrong for him or anyone to pursue excellence in a sport or whatever job you're doing. You can do it all to the glory of God. That's the key. Are you doing it to the glory of God? Do you see what God gifts he's given you from him? Therefore, to be used for him. It's like Eric Liddell, the Chariots of Fire was the, was the movie in the 80s. And Eric Liddell, the great Scottish international rugby player and Olympic gold medal winner back in the 1930s. Uh, also a Christian man who went to die on the mission field in uh, in China after uh, his running career said, you know, God made me for China, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. So God gives us gifts. And when we use them, recognizing that with excellence for his glory, you actually feel the pleasure of, of God himself in what you're doing. And so just all of those things, because Jake's become uh, somewhat successful uh, in his early career. Um, and unless you recognize all, th what do you have that is not given by God? Uh, then success can puff up a man and it's a very seductive thing and pride can rise in the heart. And so all of these things I've been trying to, well, I've tried to train Jake in and, and, uh, and advise him in as much as I can that he would then be his own man. And I think that's the other thing is, for a father with a son is uh, they reach a certain age and they are, they have to be their own man. They, they're not going to be and do everything exactly the way that you do that. And sometimes you might sit back and you have to let him make a mistake if he's going to do it his way, but that will be part of him being a man. And so all those things that I've tried to do with Jake at different stages, he's 27 now and uh, only he's been married five years, uh, baby on the way, established his business and uh and his fighting career and uh and he's growing as a spiritual um, man so you know by god's grace he's doing very well that's good that's really good um, i wonder do you ever uh do you ever go go to his gym and, and train my tie yourself i think i broke my hand one time that i did it <laughs> <laughs> i don't I, it's e evening sessions they have a lot in and i'm i don't go down there and, and get involved yeah uh, I'm not really a, you know, I've done some you know, boxing training or martial arts training at times, and it's not particularly my favorite way of training, uh, though it's very good and very difficult. Uh, it's great for fitness. So I've usually done my training by that time of the day. If I'm going to do it, I get mine done in the morning. Um, but I've watched him fight all over his life. I've traveled to watch him all over the world, and uh, uh, I do enjoy doing that. It's real good. I am curious though, uh, what does your fitness regime look like? What, what, what is a workout for you look like these days? Yeah, I'll probably work out. I'll probably run uh, five to six days a week. So my workout, I'll have one day off, maybe a Sunday. Um, and I'll run and, and my, you know, it might be a half an hour run, long distance run. Uh, and then the next day it might, I might be doing laps, you know, 400 meters rest, 400 meters rest. And then I might be doing sprint. So I vary my running each day, but I usually I'm running for like a half an hour, 40 minutes session. And then I, I hit the gym and then I've got a circuit that I do uh, regularly every day working, you know, parts of the body. Uh, and then I did kind of a, a leg, if you like, a leg day a couple of times a week on top of that, just to keep strong. Because when you're, when you're my age, when you're over 50, the muscles, it, it's tough to keep it going. You're not, you're fighting a losing battle, put it that way. And it's when you're your age, you, you recover quick, you put on muscle quick, it's, it's easier. But my age, you've got to keep on top. And so I just do that and I try and do it early. 
uh, you know, read my Bible, pray, do my physical exercise, and then I can sit down to my to my job, you know, what I'm doing in terms of I'm writing a sermon or I've got pastoral visits to do or I'm preparing for a trip somewhere or yeah. I've got Zoom calls to make. I'll, I'll do that afterwards. Yeah. That's good. That's, that's really good. That's, that's very helpful, actually. Uh, it's good to know that you still keep fit even after almost 20 years of, of retirement. <laughs> it's good. You, you need to make it part of your route. This is the thing. To be disciplined is key. You've mm-hmm. got to have disciplines in your life. Spiritual, physical disciplines are very, very important. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. I'm um, actually just speaking a little bit about uh, uh, going back into your football career. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, you played at the highest level. You played with some of the, uh, the, 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 the best players to ever play the game. Um, you've made a little bit of history for yourself. Um, I believe you were the first player to score a hat-trick for Chelsea in, in the Premier League era. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, you've played at, at really at the highest level there is. Um, what was it like being a Christian in that environment? And, and what did it look like for you to, to, to keep your integrity and your, and your Christian witness? Hmm. Yeah, a lot of people ask me that. They say, you know, is it difficult being a, a top-level athlete and a uh, and a christian uh and i my first answer is that um it's difficult to be a christian in any walk of life Mm. um you know you're you're always under pressure from the world your own sin and um and to to maintain that christian integrity um the difference with being a professional athlete is probably the intensity of life that you live in and the public nature of it Mm. intensity is like massive highs and massive lows within a couple of days Mm. you know where your face is all over the newspapers uh being glorified one day and then within three days you're the villain uh and you might have lost your place in the team Mm. and then and then that obviously links with the public nature of it so people are always watching you Mm. your teammates are watching you the crowd is watching you the press are watching you uh, and if you say one thing and you are another, they'll be quick to to knock you down. Um, so being a, a Christian footballer, you know, you are all Christians are ambassadors of Christ. The Bible says so. You know, we're representing Jesus, whether we're in, the, you know, whatever workplace, school place, um, artists, whatever we are, or, or, or professional athletes, we're representing Christ. But obviously, there's a big audience. Uh, in one sense as a as a professional so that that was the one of the big differences and and then what helped me maintain that was uh having a a regular devotional life being in a church regularly and having good mentors around me Mm, that's very good Um, that's very very good um i'm actually just curious to know it's a bit of a fun question as well um which premier league manager today would you do you think you'd enjoy playing for if you if you're still playing today yeah, I mean, I, I like the way that Jurgen Klopp obviously handles himself. I do like Pep Guardiola. Um, I think he would be fun to play for. Um, uh, maybe I'd like to play for Frank Lampard because I was an attacking midfielder. I was I was a attacking midfielder, goal scoring midfielder before Frank Lampard at Chelsea. So uh, um, Frank was way better than me because he scored a lot more and played a lot more for Chelsea in, in, in more glorious days than I did. But, uh, you know, Frank and I played against each other and uh, I think Frank would uh, maybe appreciate my style of play. And I think I'd probably fit quite well into Chelsea's uh, system, almost as, a, as an inside forward there with a real uh, freedom to get forward and score and create goals. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, that's... Um, I think you still got it, you know? I, I really... <laughs> I, I played football with you a couple of years ago and I hurt my back. Uh, you won't if you remember, but I, I remember I got a back. Yeah, I, I had a shot. This is why I've not got it yeah. anymore. I had a shot in the game and my back went into a spasm. The next day I was speaking at, at the church and I could barely get out of the chair to get up onto the <laughs> stage. So uh, I think my playing days of, uh, at that level have, have gone even. And here's me trying to organize a game for the next time I see you. So. <laughs> If it's walking football, we can do it. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. That's awesome. Um, uh, another question. It's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, I kind of laughed as I was, as I was um, preparing to ask you this, but 
Uh, you, you, you have a great sense of style. Um, and I've heard Owen Strand talk, <laughs> talk about your sense of style several times, uh, but it really is awesome. Um, you really look like, you know, you belong on magazine covers and that kind of thing, uh, which is incredible. Um, you, you clearly pay attention to, to, to the way you carry yourself and the way you dress. Um, what advice do you have for men who, who want to improve their sense of style? Mm. Well, I think uh, it's important for, for, for a man to, to, to dress well according to the budget that you have. Um, mm. But clothes are not everything by any means. Mm. Um, but I think it, a man ought to be uh, clean, you know, hygienic. That's mm. very important. And, um, and so then how he dresses and presents himself is a bit of a reflection maybe of what, what is on the inside. So this is what you've got to... I think what you've got to remember, you know, um, and so, you know, what are, what are manly clothes, what, you know, and, and traditionally manly clothes. So obviously the, you know, the jacket would have like, I'm wearing like a sport jacket here, um, would have been, you know, with the, with the shoulders, you know, emphasizing the man's broader shoulders, it's different to the woman and, you know, that kind of little bit of a squarer, uh, look. Um, and I, I think to, to present yourself in a, in a manly way, to build a, a, a wardrobe wisely with the, with the budget that you have, um, to, to present yourself well shows an attitude of mind. So for instance, on a match day, I like to wear a suit. Mm. But I don't wanna go in the track. Like a lot of teams now, they wear the club track suit. And, and that's okay, I, you know, it's they've got the club badge on it and all of that. But, but a suit or a club suit with the club badge on it, it's, it says to me, I'm getting ready for work now. You know, I've got a, I've a work mentality. You know, a young man who goes out with, uh, who's dating, seriously dating, we're not talking about dating on this thing, uh, podcast, maybe that's another one. But he's yeah. dating a young woman. You want to present yourself well, be clean, you know, be, be, be well kept. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a clean shirt, a sharp shirt, a, a, a jacket maybe. You know, even if you're wearing a pair of jeans, make sure your shoes are clean. You know, look at a man, look at his shoes. Is he, are his shoes clean? As clean as they can be, even if you're in a dusty country. Um, those kinds of things. And I don't think you need a lot, of, uh, a lot of money to do it. I think you can be wise in the way you get things from. And uh, you build a wardrobe with, the, you know, you need a jacket in your wardrobe. You need a, uh, you need a you know, good pair of trousers, uh, chinos, jeans, shoes, shirts. Um, and then you can have your casual if you like, but we're very much more casual now than we used to be. Uh, it used to be, you know, in many restaurants, you couldn't get in without a tie and jacket. And then it went, oh, well, it's an open neck shirt like this, but you must have a jacket. And then it's just, oh, well, you have to have a shirt. Now you can just wear what you want into restaurants. Standards have slipped. And I'll finally say this, it's easy to be scruffy and unkempt. It takes effort and thought and wisdom to be well kept. Mm -hmm. uh, present yourself rightly. And, and so, you know, even the Apostle Paul speaks about uh, the way that men wear their hair and women wear their hair as a, as a you know, a representation of, of being male or female. There should be a difference there and it should present itself well. So masculine dressing is what is appropriate for a, a man in the culture in which you live. Um, and that's going to look different here where I am in, in Calgary to if you're a Maasai warrior, uh, you're going to look a lot different to the gear that they wear. But those guys are pretty tough guys, if you ask me, pretty manly men. Um, but whatever is appropriate for the culture, then being clean, well kept and building an appropriate uh, wardrobe. And I, yeah, I think that without making it uh, the, the primary thing, I think it's an important thing. And I'll say one last thing on it. Um, in terms of preaching, um, you know, I, I like to wear a, a tie and a jacket or a suit when I preach because of the sense of occasion as well. Uh, I, I'm, I'm preaching the word of God. I'm, if I was announcing the news at 10 on BBC One, I'd be dressed for the occasion. Uh, if I was going to meet the Queen, I'd be dressed for the occasion. Why wouldn't I be dressed for the occasion to preach? rather than just, you know, in, in my casual round neck t-shirt that I'd be wearing at home on, on an evening and just 
chilling. So it, 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 it's dressing that to fit the occasion. And I think sometimes we think I dress to fit what I feel like mm. rather than what suits the occasion, what's appropriate. Yeah. That's really good. That's really good. I'd love to read a book where you know, you're talking about fashion and style. Um, yeah. Yeah. It could be a new book idea. Absolutely. In fact, speaking about books, you've got an autobiography coming out next year. I do. I've written my uh, biography, um, which has been a couple of years in the, in the works now. And it's my life story uh, from, you know, uh, Premier League footballer to BBC pundit to Christian pastor. And, you know, I'm talking about everything from my childhood, all the stories of, you know, different clubs that I was at, at Chelsea, at Newcastle, promotions, FA Cups, all of those things. And I'm weaving in the fact that there's a greater glory uh, to life than football, fame and fortune. Uh, and that is knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. Um, but it's accessible. It's written to encourage Christians, but it's written actually uh, for anyone to read, uh, whether you're a man or a woman, uh, young or old. Uh, even if you're not interested in, in sport massively, um, I'm touching on, the, all through it, I'm touching on deep issues of life. Um, on fatherlessness, on marriage, on on dis, uh, on suffering and disability, on um, on death uh, uh, and and life, on racism, all of issues that we are all embraced in in different ways in life. Whatever you walk of life you're in, whether you're a Christian or not, I'm touching on those. So it's, there's a human interest side to it as well. So it's a sports biography. It's a it's a Christian biography is a human interest story and it's going to be coming out um published by christian focus it's going to be coming out in the spring of 2021 it's just in with the editors at the moment that's that's fantastic i, I look forward to uh to diving into that book and it'd be great if we do an interview around that time as well just to uh create some um some heat for it even here so i'm really looking yeah, forward I, I will get you uh, a, a copy for sure fantastic Fantastic. Matt, speaking about getting a copy of a book, what do I have to do to get a, a signed number 10 jersey of Gavin Peacock? <laughs> <laughs> if I had one that I could give you, I would have signed it and sent it already. Uh, you can make one up <laughs> and I'll sign it, no problem. But an original, I've got uh, my Chelsea uh, number 10 FA Cup final shirt. That oh, wow. I, uh, I put a picture, I think, on my uh, Twitter. Yeah. Uh, my Instagram page uh, a few weeks ago um, but I yeah I mean it was it was interesting because when I was playing mm. a lot of my uh, contemporaries were keeping their shirts or swapping their shirts especially when we were pra playing in Europe with Chelsea okay. but it, it, you know, the shirt swapping wasn't massively done but it started to come in and I wasn't really thinking you know I didn't really keep my shirts you just didn't do it and yeah. I wish I had you know I've got uh, I've got one number 10 Wow, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, for the record, I don't mind a Geordie jersey either. So, you know, <laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> um, just finally, uh, Pastor Gavin, um, what, what, what final words do you have to say to the fraternity of, of ordinary gentlemen? Like, what, what would you encourage the men who listen to this podcast to, to live by and to, um, uh, to want to live up to? that they should, things that they should live up to? Yeah. Um, well, we need men. Men are, are, the, are the great order of the day, uh, if, if, if in one sense. But, but, but biblical men, men who, who live according to, to God's design uh, for them as men. You know, men ultimately who will be like uh, Jesus Christ. Um, a man of, of, of courage and conviction, uh, who knows what he believes and who will sacrifice uh, to stand on his beliefs for the good of others. Mm -hmm. um, we need men as well who uh, exercise wisdom. Um, so it's all right having knowledge, but you need to be able to apply that knowledge. And so we need uh, men who will father other men, if you like, to, uh, to be able to apply the knowledge that they have to actually be wise men. Um, and so this is a great need. The Bible is all sufficient. 
Uh, we need to believe it. We need to teach it. We need to embrace it. And here's the thing. Manhood is catching. So, so you get, you know, you, you got a, uh, a little bit of a following with this, uh, with this thing you're doing now. You get a group of men together starting to, to, to follow you. Um, they won't ultimately follow you. Hopefully they're going to be following Jesus and what he says is a, is a true man. Um, there's a great need. This is why you see people like Jordan Peterson have a great following of young men because he's giving them something to aspire to. Yeah. And he's on their side and yet he's calling them to us, but he hasn't got the word of God. Mm. His full show, what, what you're doing and aspiring to uh, is, 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 the, is the standard. And by God's grace, uh, you know, there'll be a new generation of, of men that, that rise up and, and embrace manhood in all of the many ways and more that we've discussed today. Absolutely. I really appreciate this, Pastor Gavin, and I, I just want to take this moment as well to just uh, thank you for being uh, such a phenomenal influence in my own life. I, I'm honestly blessed and honored to have men like you in my corner. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for you beyond words. Thank you so much. Well, it's been a pleasure to be part of your life in the last few years and hopefully for many to come. And good to see how you yourself are uh, uh, taking dominion and, and exercising your own manhood in, in, in your life with your wife and, and little one and, uh, and even what you're doing with this. So uh, well done, Lennox. It's great. I really appreciate that, sir. Uh, well, you know, this was a, a, an episode with, with Gavin Peacock. And uh, I, really, I really hope that you will, you'll benefit from this. And I've really enjoyed having this conversation. Um, yeah, let's, have, let, let's do this again sometime, Pastor Gavin. Um, and yeah, talk about no some problem. more things to do with manhood. Yeah. Definitely. Anyway, thanks again for joining uh, The Ordinary Gentleman today. Uh, once again, let us be found faithful rather than wanting.